The History of Vidrian The country of Vidrian is bounded on the south by the lower Cori River, from Port Freedom to the Lake of Vanished Armies, on the east by the River of Lost Tears, the Bandu Hills, and the Zimi River, on the north by the tropical rainforests of the Kava Lands, and finally on the west by the wide and placid Desperation Bay, which makes for one of the safest and most secure natural harbors on the western coast of Garand. However, these lines on the map did not exist until 600 years ago, when Chelish colonizers crudely drew them on a map, delineating what territory they thought would help secure them the right resources for their growing imperial ambitions. Prior to that time, these lands were inhabited by a mix of Mwangi tribes and cultures, each carving out their individual territories. These included the Bandu tribe, a Bekyar tribe for whom the Bandu hills would later be named, the Basso tribe, peaceful Zenj nomads who followed the antelope herds through the plains surrounding Kalabuto and Mazali, the Ijo and Ombo tribes, highly skilled tribes of Bonuat fisherfolk who historically made their homes around Desperation Bay, the Kalabuta tribe, for whom the city of Kalabuto would later be named and who settled into these ancient ruins, though its mysterious origins predate their people by untold millennia, the Mula tribe of central Vidrian, another ethnically distinct group, but who frequently identify themselves culturally with the other Zenj tribes. The Yemba tribe, a Bekyar tribe of fierce warriors said to be allied with cannibal ghouls that lived along the upper river of Tears and the rivers of Burst Souls. Finally, in addition to the major human societies in the Laughing Jungle that was the home of the Songo halflings, According to their songs, the Songo halflings ventured into the Laughing Jungle long before the Mwangi Expanse became a target for exploitation by various empires of Galarian. They crossed treacherous landscapes such as vast oceans, deserts, and mountains to find a place that was just as dangerous but felt like home. Despite being considered a minor and persistent annoyance in the records of the region's conquests, the Songo halflings have always preferred to remain inconspicuous or avoid being found altogether. For around six centuries, they avoided contact with outsiders and forced anyone who encountered them to keep their existence a secret. It's possible over time that history may yet learn that the Songos had a secret role in Vidrian independence, but currently that remains just tall tales and story songs. A third major group can be found in the region. Along the modern border with the Kava lands is one of the demesnes of the Ekuje elves. The history of the Ekuje diverged from that of the other elves on Galarian at the time of Earthfall in minus 5293. While most elves elected to leave for their ancestral realm of Severian to survive the disaster, the Ekuje clans instead decided to stay behind, despite having knowledge of the coming devastation. When the earth shattered and the skies went black, the Ekuje remained to defeat a great darkness that arose from the destruction, possibly sparing the remaining life on Galarian from total extinction. Despite most scholars' belief that the identity of this great darkness is lost to time, or that the whole story is simply a fanciful legend told by the elves, the Ekuje know the truth of their ancestral foe, though they never call it by its common name. The great darkness was an incarnation of the dragon god Dahak, who had been lured to Galarian by the death and chaos that racked the world during that terrible time. In the Age of Darkness, the Ekuje elves trapped the god's incarnation in an elf gate called the Hunter Gate, which unfortunately effectively severed the connections between the remaining Ayudara. This victory came at a great cost, as the most heroic and virtuous Ekuje elves sacrificed themselves to bolster the strength of the remaining Ekuje warriors, who managed to pierce the flesh of the dragon god. While they accomplished the miraculous feat of defeating the god's living aspect with mortal magic and hands, they ultimately only wounded and imprisoned the dragon god. Thus, most Ekuje consider their inability to finish off their foe cleanly a failure, as a result, it became the sacred duty of all Ekuje to prepare for Dahak's return in honor of their ancestors' courage and sacrifice. Throughout the ages of anguish and destiny, these various peoples lived in these lands, with the occasional territorial conflict between each other, but otherwise largely keeping to themselves and their respective ways. Although not directly within the country's boundaries, a significant event occurred in the year minus 308, when a great city was founded just outside the Screaming Jungle, just east of modern Vidrian. At this site, a lineage of warrior kings and queens, who claimed to be descended from the lion god Chohar, established the city. This city, Mizali, would become the largest and most influential cultural center in the region. These people were fiercely proud of their fighting skills, and mummified their royal family and the royal family's followers in the hopes that this would safeguard their capital, even after their deaths. 
The early rulers quickly expanded their power over nearby territories, imposing heavy taxes to fund their armies. However, once they gained control over the area, the opportunities for battle and glory became scarce. By minus 200, the ruling families had become preoccupied with rebuilding and transforming the greatest warriors from among their military forces into gladiatorial champions. They demanded more children from outlying areas to train for their blood games, more valuable items for their lavish prizes, and more food and fabric to attract audiences for their games. In 2653, the first Abyssinian colonialists arrived in southern Garin. They would arrive by ship and land in Blood Cove, the northernmost settlement in the Kava lands. This is, of course, before the split of the old Talden Empire, and these colonialists did not come to be permanent settlers, but were rather traders and merchants looking to secure trade agreements with local peoples. Although they went by a different name then, these were the precursor mercantile factions to the powerful Aspis Trade Consortium of today, which is currently headquartered in the Chelish city of Ostenso. As a result of this foreign investment, Blood Cove would become a powerful nation-state in its own right, but this place of early Avestinian settlement was never incorporated into the Talden Empire. Meanwhile, in Mazali, in 3967, a coalition of regional governors and local religious leaders formed the Council of Mwanyisa to break the ruling family's grip on the region's economy. One of the young princes of the royal family, Walkenna, had died of illness a few decades before the revolt and was entombed in a hurry in a tomb intended for a famous gladiator. The council's militant followers searched for the royal tombs and destroyed the mummies, but they missed Walkenna's, leaving him to rest in obscurity for centuries. Just over a hundred years later, a pretty significant event occurred that I've discussed in my Taldor video, in my Cheliax video, and in my History of the World of Galarian video before that. In 4081, the Talden Empire split. Cheliax became the successor to the Talden imperialist ways, and they sought to expand and make a name for themselves in their own right. By 4138, only 50 years after the split, Chelish ships arrived in Desperation Bay as part of a colonial effort ordered by Prince Haliad I of Cheliax. Construction began on a temporary stockade, which would later be named Eladar, and Baron Pretorius was appointed as colonial governor. At this time, the colonists began having their first encounters with the various Mwangi tribes of the region. In 4142, Prince Haliad I visited Eladar to check on the colony's progress. Misunderstanding the name the colonists had given to their land, the confused prince dubbed the colony Sargava after his favorite horse. In 4150, the Chelish colonists conquered the city of Kalabuto and began to establish the borders of their colonial territory at the River of Lost Tears. The Kalabuta tribe quickly began to revolt against colonial leadership, but the uprising was just as quickly put down by Chelish troops, who had superior armor, weapons, and powerful divine magic conferred by Aridonite clerics. In 4217, the Kalabuta tribe revolted once again over colonial efforts to forcibly convert its members to the worship of Aridon. The rebellion was once again quelled, but the Chelish agreed to allow the tribes to worship as they pleased. In 4418, Chelish Corvosans came to Sargava with a ship full of dwarven explorers from Yanderhof, with whom the city had been trading extensively since the Chelish occupation of southern Varicia. They began mining for precious metals in the Bandu Hills, followed shortly thereafter by gnome miners looking for rare gems and minerals. Dwarven miners also discovered a vein of gold in Mount Nakuk, establishing the Far South Mines. Fort Bandu was built to protect miners from both violent Bekyar tribes and the hostile hobgoblins of the region. By 4426, competition between the various Bandu Hill mining companies turned to open fighting, and the Deep Treasure Mining Company, one of the smallest concerns in the period, barely survived. Their offices in Kalabuto were burned down, and their officers presumed dead. However, by the end of that year, the Deep Treasure Mining Company resurfaced deep in the Bandu Hills and quickly overcame its rivals to emerge as the foremost mining concern in Sargava and the Mwangi Expanse. Starting two years later, from 4428 to 4431, a three-year-long open war between the mining syndicates occurred, where private militias had been hired to wrest the region from Deep Treasure control. At the end of this conflict, the Deep Treasure Mining Corporation abandoned its headquarters, but managed to continue operations from a series of secret bases scattered throughout the Bandu Hills. In 4577, in Sargava's capital of Eladar, Baron Gralis was born to Baroness Alexia of House Davian. By 4600, Baron Gralis Davian would become the new governor of Sargava and the High Lord of the capital city of Eladar. 
Six years after his ascension, the death of prophecy occurred. In Western Garand, the most significant event was not the death of Aradin, but the sudden formation of the Eye of Abendego, which all but severed Sargava's ties to its motherland. Additionally, after Aradin's death in 4606, a gradual transformation in Chelish culture and society commenced. While internecine warfare plagued Cheliax, fundamentally changing its people, Baron Gralis, who was still the governor of Sargava at that time, pledged his loyalty to his family on the mainland. During the Chelish Civil War, House Davian was kept afloat by the financial backing of Sargava and its Gerundi interests. The Sargavan colony had become quite wealthy exploiting the indigenous workforce and relying on the coast's many rich natural resources and the various working mining operations despite the setbacks of the mining wars. In spite of Baron Gralis's great wealth, it was not sufficient, and supporting House Davian's armies on the home front meant expanding their sphere of control. In 4610, Baron Gralis tried to take control of the nearby major settlement of Mazali, using colonial forces stationed at Kalabuto. Things did not go as planned. In the intervening years, the Council of Mwanyisa in Mizali had stumbled upon the mummy of Walkenna and his treasures, leading to several councillors having visions of the city's resurgence, with its ancient solar disk emblem replacing the sun. The council believed that Mizali was fated to reclaim its regional power, and put the mummified prince on display, inviting neighbouring people to witness their proud history. When Sargavan colonial forces from Kalabuto came to plunder the city, the mummy rose to defend the city with holy fire establishing himself as the city's ruler. Outraged by the invasion, the newly risen Walkenna vowed to rid the expanse of the invaders and gain the support of various resistance movements as well. This setback in Sargava may have had far-reaching consequences. In 4639, House Davian was forced into a last desperate battle with House Thrun due to dwindling finances. They held a final battle for the fate of the country outside Corentin, called the Battle of a Hundred Kings, which House Thrun won decisively. For some additional details on the Chelish Civil War, you may also want to see my regional deep dive video on Cheliax. With House Thrun unexpectedly ascended to the Chelish throne, Gralis had no choice but to seek formidable local allies to shield himself from the retaliation of his native land. The Free Captains, notorious pirates from the Shackles, had always been adversaries of Cheliax and Sargava, pillaging the merchant fleets transporting trade goods between the colony and the motherland. Despite their criminal activities, the pirates were shrewd businessmen and agreed to provide their services in shielding the Sargavan colonials from their former countrymen. In 4643, the Chelish Armada arrived in full force to replace Governor Gralis Davian and reassert control over the colony. The free captain fleet from the shackles struck, decimating the entire Chelish Armada and sinking it to the depths of Desperation Bay. Although it came at a high price, the free captains honored their end of the deal, enabling Sargava to operate independently without fear of Chelish retaliation. Effectively, 4643 became the date of the first Sargavan independence. Of course, that would not be the last time Cheliax attempted to recapture its lost colony, but thankfully for the colonialists, the independent colony of Sargava was kept secure because Governor Gralis Davian continued to pay a stipend to the pirates to secure those waters. In 4660, a second Chelish Armada moved south, and this time it was intercepted by free captains and driven into the Eye of Abendego. The Chelish fleet was forced to turn back after losing 30 ships to hurricane conditions. In 4662, Baron Gralis died. He was succeeded by Baron Utilinus as governor of Sargava. In 4667, Baron Utilinus traveled to Port Peril to renegotiate the protection contract with the Hurricane King. He successfully argued the Hurricane King into accepting half the normal payment due. To argue his case, he pointed to the numerous transgressions by the free captains during the previous year. In actual fact, this was a crucial negotiation for Sargava, because although the pirates provided protection from Chaliax, they did not provide any protection from the indigenous Mwangi people, who had been the primary workforce of the colonists for generations. The locals had been subjugated and oppressed since the colonists had taken over, and now that Sargava could not rely on the might of the Chelish armies to quash the occasional insurrection, the Mwangi were growing aware of their own strength and better organizing. Consequently, Baron Utilinus realized his new nation was balanced on a knife's edge, and he was fast running out of gold reserves to pay off the pirates. He knew it was only a matter of time before the Mwangi launched a final rebellion against the outsiders. That renegotiation of the protection payments to the Shackles pirates only brought Baron Utilinus and the Sargavan colonists so much time, however. 
By 4678, the newly risen child-sized god-king Walkenna was finally ready to make good on his promises of retribution from when Mazali had been invaded by the Sargavans earlier. Mazali forces seized and sacked Kalabuto. The ancient city became a battleground for an ongoing military conflict that would last six years. Finally, in 4684, the Sargavan colonists managed to retake Kalabuto, but at great cost. With their finances stretched to breaking, the Sargavan colonists became increasingly cruel taskmasters to the indigenous Mwangi people. They were effectively galvanizing separatist sentiment with each victory over Mizali and losing the internal war in the long run. In 4690 and again in 4702, Mizali agents, in coordination with local separatists, managed to retake Kalabuto, but each time the Sargavan colonists managed to take it back. In 4710, the Serpent Skull adventure path took place. In this adventure, a group of shipwrecked survivors from the large nearby island of Smuggler's Shiv, just off the coast of Sargava, learned of a plot by the ancient and secretive race of serpent folk to resurrect their dead god. They had to navigate the many political factions of colonial Sargava's capital of Eladar, including the Sargavan government itself, indigenous Mwangi separatists, the Pathfinder Society, the Aspis Consortium, the Free Captains of the Shackles, and the deadly Red Mantis Assassins. Despite the complex politics of this land, they forged crucial alliances and headed deep into Mwangi expanse to prevent the serpent folk from fulfilling their dark prophecy. In the course of this chaotic struggle, these adventurers also managed to kill the savage gorilla king of the Mwangi expanse, something which I'll delve into more deeply in a future video dedicated to that region. By 4715, colonial governor Utilinus was now in his waning years, and he had run out of chances. It was not the external forces of Walkenna and Mwazali that ended Sargavan rule but the people of Sargava itself that finally had enough. While Governor Utilinus exhausted the country's coffers in paying private protection, waging wars against Mazali, and spending money on considerable policing forces to brutally oppress any dissent to colonial rule, the native Wangi peoples, along with exasperated lower-class colonists, felt they had no choice but to rebel against their oppressors. This rebellion was sparked by a small revolt led by slaves and servants at a plantation on the outskirts of Eladar, and quickly spread nationwide, using guerrilla tactics actually learned from the free captains of the shackles in what became known as the Vidric Revolution. The tipping point came when Sargavan soldiers themselves began to defect, and so the revolutionaries were able to force the colonial nobles out of the region. They declared independence, and named their new country Vidrian, and renamed the capital city Anthusis, an older Bonuat name for that region that had existed before the coming of the Chelish. However, the struggle for independence had only just begun for Vidrian. In 4716, the free captains attempted to extort the fledgling nation, as they had with Sargava before it, but Vidrian was able to sign a deal with nearby Sengor for naval protection in exchange for expanded trade relations. The free captains were routed by a combination of Sengori ships and obgoblin mercenaries from the Bandu Hills. Vidrians are consequently very anti-pirate, and to this day, any pirate who comes to Enthusis must conceal their true occupation. This all brings us to Vidrian today. Today, Vidrian is still recovering, and although its people may mask their anxieties about an uncertain future with confidence, their unwavering determination to remain free cannot be denied. Despite its newfound independence, politics in Vidrian are as complicated as they ever were. Let's start with its people. As discussed earlier, there were seven local human tribes in the region before the Chelish came. The Bandu, the Baso, the Ijo, the Kalabuta, the Mula, the Ombo, and the Yemba tribes. However, after almost 600 years of colonial rule, indigenous people with clear ancestry are now rare. Today, most Mwangi Vidrians simply identify as Vidric. The Vidric people have a completely unique culture from among the Mwangi people of central Garand. The majority of Vidric citizens are former slaves or servants who were once subjugated by Sargavan colonizers. Many have lost their ethnic heritage over many generations, and most have mixed origins. While some Vidrics have adopted aspects of other Mwangi cultures, others seek to create a distinct identity for themselves. They may wear modified Sargavan fashion, such as tunics with sleeves torn off, or traditional gowns cut in non-traditional ways. Some Vidrics see wearing chains or chainless shackles as a sign of defiance. Others find it offensive. Despite their many differences, Vidric citizens share a strong desire for freedom, which they won after many hard-fought struggles. They enjoy newfound opportunities and can often be found celebrating with parties and feasts. While they are grateful for those colonialists who defected and who helped them gain freedom and respect their laws, they still harbor bitterness towards colonizers and fear the possibility of enslavement once again. 
They have even more distaste for the Bekyar people, who were complicit in the Sargavan slave trade, and it's probably just as well that the Bandu and Yemba tribes live in the more remote regions of Vidrian and apart from the Vidric majority. Speaking of the defecting colonials, those people are now commonly called Sargavans, even though that country doesn't exist anymore, and they are an interesting subgroup in their own right, and they can still be found in relatively large numbers in Vidrian today. We can think of the Sargavans, or White Vidrians, as being shaped by two major events. The first occurred in 4643, when Sargava became independent of Cheliax. That was 80 years ago now. Four generations of Sargavans have lived in Sargava and then Vidrian, knowing full well that their original homeland of Cheliax would never accept them back. Moreover, with the state religion of Cheliax becoming the Church of Asmodeus, most wouldn't want to return anyway. Although Sargavans were complicit with slavery in the colony, and should rightly be condemned for that, for their part most were not devil worshippers, and they had long since abandoned kinship with the mainland. The second major event was the Vidric Revolution. After the Vidric Revolution, the Sargavan people were split into two groups. Those who fought against the revolution mostly fled to Blood Cove or the Shackles after their defeat, where they tried to establish themselves among the pirates and other factions of organized criminals. In Vidrian, however, Sargavans who helped in the slave revolts or helped in the fight against the Shackles pirates are considered official citizens and are technically free from retribution. However, they continue to face culture clashes and growing pains as they adjust to a paradigm shift where they are no longer the dominant culture. Sargavans are viewed negatively not just in Vidrian either, but across central and southern Garand, being seen primarily as invaders and slavers. The Vidric Revolution only exacerbated this perception, and many Mwangi are now hostile towards Sargavans. Sargavans who lack wealth face significant challenges, as few Mwangi are willing to work with them, and they are often shunned. Those Sargavans who have managed to hold on to some wealth after the revolution, or who have specific in-demand skills, are also in a precarious position, because although the government has recognized them as citizens, the people consider their wealth illegitimate and are angered that there are former colonialists that still possess any measure of power and influence in the region at all. Finally, there are the miners in the Bandu Hills. The Avestinian dwarves and gnomes that worked the mines in the Bandu Hills and largely had their communities in Fort Bandu are largely viewed in the same light as the Sargavans, although the antipathy for them doesn't run quite as deep among the Vidric and other Mwangi people. The reason for this are twofold. First, the dwarf and gnomish miners never engaged in widespread settlement of the region and were consequently never in positions of gubernatorial authority. Even in Fort Bandu, where most of them lived, that was always held by Chelish Sargavan colonialists. Second is that the mining consortiums helped Vidrian establish the combined mercantile interests, something that had started to emerge organically from the need to make peace after the devastating miners' wars from 4428 to 4431. The combined mercantile interests was an allegiance of various commercial guilds, representing leaders of the assorted mercantile combines for mining, but also for shipping, trade, laborers, artisans, stonemasons, weavers, smiths, and local markets. They also provided and coordinated funding for the resistance against the pirate retaliation, and helped hire both obgoblin merchants and secure the strategic alliance with Sengor. In effect, the Avestinian dwarves and gnomes are viewed primarily through the lens of foreign merchants and not as occupiers, although they've now been living in Sargava almost as long as other Sargavans. Let's touch on the lifestyles of modern Vidrians. In the port cities, people of all stripes have their lives dominated by political, mercantile, and financial concerns, and many people work as merchants, sailors, and office clerks. These merchants work tirelessly to secure new trade deals, balance their debts and income, pay their crews and taxes, and acquire new customers to begin the cycle anew. This commercial cycle has allowed Vidrian to build a stable foundation for their future and repay their allies who helped them secure their independence, particularly Sengor. In the former jungle plantations, now converted into cooperative farmlands, life has become simpler. The farmers work together with the aid of Enthusias' government to provide most of the grain and luxury foods that comprise Vidrian's mercantile trade. In addition, there is a thriving business in welcoming adventurers and explorers who wish to excavate the many ruins and unknown regions of the Mwangi expanse. Vidric leaders even suggest shoes and heavily vet guides for adventuring parties who can ensure the outsiders make it back to port safely, dissuade them from stealing items of cultural significance, and report any who cannot be dissuaded to the proper authorities. The Pathfinder Society's local influence likewise helps soothe fears, as the agency can be trusted to not only police their own, but also assist in monitoring and sanctioning other companies to ensure that none spirit away any important sacred artifacts of the expanse. 
Under it all looms the ever-present threat of the pirate captains of the Shackles, who counted the colonial government as clients and now feel slighted by the revolutionaries for cutting off their business. For each damaged ship that comes into port, and each that never returns, the rallying cry grows louder for a larger military and navy to protect their interests from those who would love to see them fail. Religion in Vidrian is just as varied and complicated as its people are. The new nation's constitution enshrined freedom of religion as a central tenet. In Vidrian, choosing a religion is a personal decision, reflecting the newfound individual freedoms of its people. Many faiths from the inner sea were introduced to Vidrian through its ports and are prevalent in major cities. In contrast, more remote areas tend to adopt the beliefs of their closest neighbors. The Vidriks primarily worship deities such as Abadar, Gosray, Iomade, Sarenre, and Shailin, and they also draw heavily from ancestor worship and the pre-colonial gods of the Mwangi Expanse. Unfortunately, colonial expansion led to the loss of many pre-colonial religious practices, but some aspects were preserved and continue to influence local faiths today. In addition to these deities, priests of various gods have arrived in Vidrian, drawn by invitations or the promise of opportunities as the Vidriks attempt to forge a new identity in the aftermath of their rebellion and independence. The revolution also brought other obscure Mwangi deities into the mainstream. Despite this, many people still fear being punished for worshipping other Mwangi gods, such as Grandmother Spider, due to their persecution under Chelish colonial rule. However, some pockets of their worship have resurfaced in the fledgling nation. Of these resurgent gods, perhaps none is worshipped more strongly than Lubaiko. Lubaiko, an appropriate deity for the region, is also called the Spark in the Dust, and she is a goddess of wildfire, inspiration, and revolution. Her edicts are to set fires, change the world, and act with ambition, or not at all. Though a dangerous god, Lubaiko has a playful, mischievous side, just as there is erratic beauty in dancing sparks and in the teasing whisper of a candle's flame. Revolutionaries, inventors, artists, and arsonists all offer Lubaiko prayers to help their achievements spread quickly. Although she is a deity associated with causing trouble, she also has been known to intervene and protect others from destructive strife, such as saving a homestead from a natural disaster. In addition to worship of Lubaiko, worship of Walkenna has increased in popularity, especially in the eastern part of the country, closer to Mazali, where the child god rules. Finally, let's discuss the government of Vidrian. During the post-revolutionary reconstruction of Vidrian, the issue of governance was a contentious one. Suggestions of a singular ruler or a small, odd-numbered group were quickly dismissed, as were governors and custodians due to associations with colonial rule. Eventually, representatives from various walks of life decided to form their own body to govern, commonly referred to as the Council of Vidrian. The council comprises trusted leaders, including heroes of the Vidric Revolution, who were elected by various guilds and factions and serve as association spokespersons. The following groups and organizations hold the majority of the council's decision-making power. The Combined Mercantile Interests I've already mentioned this group in the context of the Dwarven and Gnomish miners of the Bandu Hills. The Combined Mercantile Interests always has representation at the Council of Vidrian. However, the frequent rotation of representatives from the mercantile interests contributes to conflicts within the larger council, as a new representative will often disagree with measures previously voted on by their predecessor. The self-serving nature of the mercantile interests often derails conversations, and their continued presence on the council is sometimes attributed only to their wide-ranging connections and contributions to the city's wealth. At any given council assembly, it is impossible to predict who will serve as a representative for the mercantile interests. The Field Unions Following the rebellion in Vidrian that ousted plantation owners and overseers, experienced workers with respected leadership pooled their resources and knowledge to provide food for the city. This loose association eventually grew into an organized coalition, which then unionized with one representative for each region of Vidrian. The Field Unions were one of the first organizations asked to sit on the new council, with Bemisola Mambi, an older woman and overseer, chosen to represent them. The Independent Bankers Guild. As the rebellion spread from Eladar, some realized the need to take stock of the valuables left behind by the Sargavan colonists for rebuilding purposes. However, even as new moneylenders established themselves, people were hesitant to seek financial aid, fearing exploitation as the colonizers had done for years. To address these concerns, the assessors developed a lending system that followed the principles of never demanding repayment from those without means and avoiding the use of hard labor and debtors' prisons. This system evolved into a network of banks and money changers that worked with the combined mercantile interests to create work programs and apprenticeships. 
While not perfect, this system aligned with the ideals of the new government without undermining it. A halfling named Meriden, who was formerly a Chelish slave before they became a free Vidrian moneylender, is the independent Bankers Guild representative on the Vidrian Council. The Represented Theologies During the colonial period, Vidrian adopted a diverse mix of various religions from across Galarian. Worshippers of deities, occult figures, ancestors, spirits, and more practiced their customs or some approximation of them as trends waxed and waned. The Vidric Revolution took action to ban Chelish diabolism and eventually codified laws to support this ban. After the revolution, the clergies who supported the rebellion and rebuilding efforts united to form the represented theologies to protect religious freedoms in the new nation. Representing the theologies is Mandla Dube, a Vidric priest of Sarenray, whose calm demeanor hides his tenacious opposition to any situation in which the theologies might lose ground, even if the loss is not particularly significant. The Vein The Council of Vidrian initially resisted the notion of forming an intelligence network, but eventually recognized its necessity for the security and protection of the nation. A Varnius, a skilled innovator and spy who played a crucial role in the revolution by coordinating the actions of Eladar's own thieves' guild, was the obvious choice to lead such an organization. Despite initially declining the offer, a Varnius eventually had a change of heart and appeared at a council meeting to announce that their group, the Vane, would be responsible for negotiations and foreign diplomacy. Their impressive efficiency has since allowed them to retain this role. The Vane takes its name from the feathers that stabilize an arrow's flight. The reasons behind Avarnius' change of heart still remains unclear. A few other small groups also have membership at the Council of Vidrian, including the Briars, a group of smugglers who are aligned with the new government and have immunity from repercussion for their activities, thanks to their special relationship, the Coalition of Medicine, which represents a faction of secular healers and alchemists, and the United Laborers, who represent other manual laborers not represented by the field union. On the positive side, rule by council has prevented the return of the brutal policing that came with colonial rule. However, all in all, the council's large number of voices and strong personalities often lead to discord, infighting, and political gridlock that hinders progress. Although Vidrian is more hopeful than ever, the troubles of its people didn't go away overnight. Violence between tribal groups, especially between Vidric and Bekyar peoples, flare up constantly around the borders. There are still large numbers of struggling and poor families throughout the country that have not found reliable work yet, and of course various criminal syndicates and networks have found use for the idle hands. Yet, all in all, though Vidrian today is a new and still relatively unsteady nation, it remains hopeful and fiercely eager to continue to protect itself and its hard-won freedom against outside foes. It has taken for its flag and symbol a phoenix of red plumage and teal tail feathers rising in a nimbus of yellow flames against a pale blue backdrop. In the wake of the revolution, the Council of Vidrian's first act was to grant their many towns, farms, and people the opportunity to rename themselves in order to throw off the shackles of colonial rule. Many did change their names, some returning to ancestral names nearly lost to time. Eladar became Enthusis, Calabuto became Umanyango, and Crown's End became Silvertree, just to name a few. These name changes are more than just symbolic. The country is rapidly finding its new identity. More than any other part of Central Garand, Vidrian today is truly a fractious clash of cultures and ideologies. What kind of nation will they become in the future? Maybe you and your players will get a chance to shape that in a future game. Important locations in Vidrian include Enthusis. The heart of Vidrian remains its capital city. Anthusis, formerly the colonial capital of Eladar, is grappling with the challenge of reconciling its origins as a small dock town with its current status as the bustling port city it was forced to become under Sargavan rule. Despite its efforts to move on from the scars of revolution, the remnants of the conflict can still be seen in eerie displays throughout the city. The statues of Baron Utilinus, the last colonial governor of Eladar, that once stood prominently in the city square, are now beheaded, their stone faces turned to dust. Meanwhile, the statue of Eladar herself, the young Chelish girl for whom the city was named, who first learned the local Mwangi language and ultimately led to the subjugation of the region, stands silenced in front of the custodian's palisades as a constant reminder of the past. The monument's arms have been hacked off, and the graffiti from the rebellion's anger, once visible on the marble, has since started to fade away. Anthusis relies heavily on Desperation Bay, a sprawling port that enables larger trading ships to transport their goods overland or upstream along the Cori River into the interior. 
The city is also a popular destination for adventurers and explorers, much to the dismay of the council and some citizens who fear the potential for exploitation. Though some businesses cater to these visitors, most locals these days tend to be unwelcoming towards foreign adventuring parties who ask about Mwangi artifacts and mysteries. The bulk of Enthusis's economic activity centers around foreign trade and local governance, with potential intrigue as the Council of Vidrian dispatches spies and scouts abroad while rooting out those placed by other factions. The Council's various organizations are constantly plotting against one another, forming alliances as circumstances demand. While the commoners appreciate the representative democracy and fair work programs, they still face struggles. Some Sargavans continue to reside in their old family homes, still enjoying the privileges that came with their former status. So for many in Vidrian, the fight for complete independence from outside rule and influence continues, and the rebellion is not yet over. Anthusis also houses the Vidrian fleet, popularly known as the Patchwork Navy. When Vidrian established its navy, it was unique in that every ship it possessed had been stolen. As a rebel group lacking government recognition, their sole means of acquiring a fleet was by daringly stealing from Sargavan or Free Captain forces. The Umbral Spark, the navy's flagship, was even taken from Hurricane Queen Tessa Fairwind herself, which is one of the many insults resulting in lasting grudges among the pirates of the Shackles. Despite now having the funds to purchase ships from foreign sellers, Vidrian is still struggling to establish its own shipbuilding industry. Consequently, the government is contemplating offering substantial incentives to attract skilled shipwrights to its cities. In the meantime, the Vidrian navy is ready to seize any hostile ships that threatens its people and is particularly interested in stories of recoverable wrecks. Bonciacion Bonciacion is a trading post that was constructed under the encouragement of an elder druid matriarch of the Songo tribes, shortly after Vidrian declared independence and renamed itself. It is the first of its kind, and it signifies the slow-growing trust that the Songos have started to develop towards the other inhabitants of the country. The encampment is built around a large tree, with a symbol carved at the halfling eye level. The market comprises well-organized tents and swiftly assembled stalled and booths for trading trinkets, excess food, dyed fabrics, woven baskets, and pottery from Lacaise for new tools, interesting books, succulent treats and spices and seasonings that are scarce in the jungle. A more permanent set of buildings constructed by Vidric merchants who came to trade stands at the fringes of the Songo encampment. The merchants also use the outpost as a staging ground and launching point for their forays into the jungle, often accompanied by Songo guides who know their land well. While the Vidric merchants are grateful for the Songo halfling's openness to trade, other outsiders who try to cheat or steal from them may face rebuff with sharp tongues, lightened pockets, and surprisingly painful stick strikes. Fort Bandu Fort Bandu, nestled within the Bandu Hills, has changed its purpose since the rebellion. While it still oversees mining operations in the hills, and still houses a number of the immigrant Avestinian dwarves and gnomes that established those mines, its new focus has shifted. Where the fort's colonial occupants prepared for sabotage and insurrection, today it works towards ensuring miner safety, safeguarding against the natural dangers of the jungle and preventing theft. Additionally, the fort serves as a training ground and a staging point for Vidrian's militia with peaceful watches allowing for personnel to become accustomed to their responsibility before moving on to more vigilant assignments. The Council intends to establish more forts and outposts in the region, and it is likely that as one of the older settlements, Fort Bandu's regional influence will continue to grow. Courier Crossing Trading Post The old town of Stark Point, now renamed Courier Crossing Trading Post, has been struggling to revive its economy. The population has dwindled since the Vidric Revolution, with most young and able residents leaving for better opportunities elsewhere. To demonstrate its safety and peacefulness as a place to live and work, the remaining populace have taken efforts to cleanse and reconsecrate the town and cemetery. The town's patron god used to be Aridin, and it was built around a very large church. Aridin has been gone for over a hundred years, and yet no other faith has reclaimed the old church yet. Lakaise. Lakaise is the sole permanent settlement of the Songo people, and is located on the banks of the Korea River. The town is surrounded by small fields of crops such as beans, maize, and yams. It also has a central square that is used for the seasonal Kanafete celebrations. The town has a diverse range of buildings that could accommodate all the nomadic Songos of the Mwangi expanse if necessary. Many Songos temporarily reside in the town to assist their extended families and satisfy the wanderlust of other residents. Some prefer this way of life and travel less, while others only stay if necessary. 
A few daring Songos and Lakaisei have started exploring trade and commerce, starting with Vidrian. After caravans have been supplied and enough stores have been set aside for the next Canafete, any surplus is packed and taken to Bonciacion for trade. The buildings in Lacaise are made of found stone and fired brick, painted in bright and vibrant colours and patterns that mirror Songo clothing and makeup. These buildings convey many stories to those who can read them. Along with providing facilities for drying, smoking and storage, Lacaise is also known for fermenting a tea-based beer that is highly coveted by some outsiders, as it is reserved for special occasions only. The grand arena called Estad de Bomaye is located adjacent to Lacaise as well. This is the site of the great triannual stick fighting tournament held during the seasonal gathering of elders called the Canafete. Described as something between an intricate fencing duel and an epic clash of longswords, stick fighting is a grueling test of strength, skill, and endurance, all set to high tempo music. Songos believe that by withstanding the painful welt from an opponent's stick and rising above the pain to overcome them, they may prove themselves worthy champions of their people. The arena remains vacant for much of the year, falling into disrepair as Songos go about their nomadic lives. However, when a tournament approaches, workers clean the arena and make any necessary repairs, chase out vermin, and replenish medical supplies. They also touch up the paint around the building, adding new murals depicting the best of the recent fights that took place within. The infirmary is the most robustly built structure in the Estad, and is the only part of the arena that is maintained throughout the year. It serves as a place for stick fighters to recover from injuries during tournaments or even afterwards if the injuries are severe. It also serves all traveling Songo caravans throughout the year, providing them a place to heal and rest for as long as necessary without disturbing the flow of life and commerce in Lacaise. Recently, the arena has been used more often throughout the year as a place to train in the art of stick fighting. In the weeks leading up to the Canafete, aspiring champions spar for hours at a time. Some even arrive early to train before their caravans. What started as an informal school for competitive students has grown to include anyone willing to teach stick fighting to any student tough enough to withstand the rigorous training, up to and including outsiders for the very first time. Maneri Valley Cattle Ranch Formerly known as Freehold, the Maneri Valley Cattle Ranch was historically owned and operated by the wealthy Chelish Machini family. Before the revolution, Mindra and her grandfather Olgren, who ran the farm before her, believed in paying fair wages and offering basic Chelish educations to the indigenous Mwangi workers who labored there. The Machinis were supporters of the rebellion, and following the revolution, Mindra reduced her role to financier and entrusted daily operations to two Mwangi siblings that were familiar with her operation. Together they renamed the farmstead to Maneri Valley Cattle Ranch, honoring the land on which it stands. While some argue that Mindra should divest herself of all claims to the land, others view her as representing the ideal of cooperation with outsiders in an equitable exchange that benefits both parties. Port Freedom Port Freedom, a river outlet town, was ruled by the native Wangi long before the Vidric Revolution. Their rivermen's guild, with its reliable barge navigation, allowed them to retain control of the town and the Korea River route inland, as well as its immediate outlet into Desperation Bay. Port Freedom managed to maintain its autonomy by never directly opposing colonial rule, but Sargava's directives were often handled more like suggestions there. After the revolution, the Rivermen's Guild is now at the core of the combined mercantile interests, gaining increased political clout and has been rumored to be seeking control over more towns from behind the scenes. Just south of Port Freedom lies an extensive river delta, famed for an extraordinary type of superfauna. The Delta Lions, the largest lions in the Mwangi Expanse, possibly due to their excessive muscle growth from continuous swimming and an abundance of prey, can grow up to five times the size of a typical predatory cat. These Delta Lions are capable of taking down colossal prey, like the large cattle that Vidrian herders raise, as well as water buffaloes and even elephants. Although these lions mainly remain in the delta and only attack humanoids if provoked, vidricks generally keep their distance from the southern border. However, this doesn't deter trophy hunters, animal tamers, or ambitious naturalists from venturing into the swampy waters in search of one of these remarkable beasts. Silvertree The town of Silvertree, formerly known as Crown's End, was renamed after the revolution, inspired by the grove of nearby trees whose unique silver leaves cannot be found anywhere else in Garand. The town has been in a state of soft conflict with the Council of Vidrian since the Vidric Revolution. As its northernmost town, the Council wants to establish a naval base there, while the townspeople would prefer it to become a centre for trade and commerce. 
Many of Silvertree's residents have a criminal record and have cut deals or fled to evade prosecution for slavery, smuggling, or piracy. Many of its citizens are now affiliated with the Briars, a smuggling syndicate granted special dispensations by the government for its support of the Vidrian rebels during the revolution. Today, the combined mercantile interests fear for the Briars' growing political power, and it and other groups are pushing hard to establish the naval base, not least in the hopes an active naval yard will allow some policing of the criminal networks and smooth over some of Silvertree's rougher edges. The populace here is disgruntled, and includes many Sargavans who only reluctantly defected when they saw who was going to be the clear victor in the revolution. The problems in Silvertree are therefore most likely only just beginning. Smuggler's Shiv Smuggler's Shiv is a small, uninhabited island that has gained a special place in the hearts of the people of Anthusis and other ports along Desperation Bay. The island became well known during the rebellion when the free captains scuttled many ships on its shores while the Anthusis rebels bled the Sargavan government dry with the help of a few Shackles pirates. The island was declared a safety hazard after expeditions to it by the council ended in failure. Still, Tales persist of undead creatures guarding the treasures of the free captains, and these stories continue to attract people foolhardy enough to seek the island out. The Stasis Fields About 200 years ago now, a group of adventurers searching through some of the abandoned mines of the deep treasure conglomerate uncovered an underground prison, filled with armored warriors who appeared to be frozen in time. This cavernous complex, located among the treacherous reaches of the Bandu Hills, is an irresistible lure for explorers and adventurers. However, the location of the fields is shrouded in secrecy, and once the entrance is found, would-be explorers would have to contend with ancient and deadly warding spells that would prevent them from getting too close to the frozen prisoners, or attempting to steal their equipment without awakening them. Sweet Fields, Farms, and Distillery Sweetfields is one of the largest sugarcane growers in Vidrian, and a primary producer of rums and candies within the combined mercantile interests. It was established on the bones of Aryan Manor Plantation, which was burnt down by its slaves in a controlled burn as they trapped the retreating nobles. Only the manor house was destroyed, and the fields and distilling equipment were untouched. Sweetfields' commitment to crafting high-quality products and the help of the alchemists' commune in Mnyango have made its spirits highly sought after in foreign markets. Umnyango. Umnyango, formerly known as Calabuto, is technically the largest city in Vidrian, but its location and the Port Freedom Riverman's Guild chokehold on the Kori River made it unsuitable for a capital city. The city has thrived as a bastion of history and traditions forgotten elsewhere in western Garand, and its original settlers, the Calabuta tribe, moved in and reworked the ruins of a much older civilization that had long since abandoned it. Colonial Calabuto had a long and difficult history with the nearby city-state of Mazali. During the Chalish Civil War, they attempted to conquer Mizali, but the child god Walkenna, a risen mummy, had thwarted them. Then, in retaliation, Mizali's army had managed to take the city on a number of occasions. As a consequence of Mizali agents deliberately stoking insurrectionist sentiment and spreading its influence throughout the city and the surrounding region, even before the revolution, belief in the child god Walkenna was growing among the indigenous population. After the revolution, this faith has grown substantially. Yet this religion's rapid growth has been stymied somewhat by some fairly adamant opposition. Today, belief in Walkenna is confined to a small portion of Mnyango's people, kept in check by those Vidriks who fought for their own freedoms and recognize an oppressive worldview when they see it, as well as refugees from Mazali itself who fled to Mnyango in recent years for fear of retribution from their undead child god, whom they recognize as a powerful autocrat and despot. Still, a central tenant of Vidrian's new identity is religious freedom, so while Kenna's faith does continue to find converts, and those who believe are eager to spread the word of Walkenna through whatever means necessary. Like many other places, the city was scarred by the Vidric Revolution, and by many other conflicts before this, and efforts are ongoing to rebuild. Despite trepidations about the child god to the east, the people of Umnyango have chosen to model the new structures in their city after Mizali architecture, as they wish for their city to flourish in the same way. Mm -hmm.